from Jesse Blanton this morning who gave us a, a nice broad overview of rabies prevention and control and then Dr. Drenzik um, delved, into that, delved into that a little bit further um, to give us the nuts and bolts of you know the rabies risk assessment etc. So what I wanted to try to do today is kind of tie that all in together and just present to you um, very briefly what resources we have in the state of Georgia and how we approach things um, here in our state. Um, and then I picked one interesting animal rabies case and um, our only human or m recent um, human rabies case, recent being back in 2000, to um, give you some um, interesting details about um, those two um, cases. So it's always nice to be here at my alma mater. Just wanted to show my support. Um, and again, um, I wanted to just discuss um, the uh, Georgia Rabies Control and Notifiable Disease Statutes that have been previously mentioned. And then um, describe the rabies prevention and control infrastructure here in Georgia. Um, discuss animal rabies testing here in Georgia. And briefly review the surveillance data. And then again, discuss the animal and human rabies case. So Dr. Drenzik mentioned um, the Georgia Rabies Law. The statute is um, OCGA 3119. That's the entire chapter. And I'm certainly not an attorney, and I really have a difficult time interpreting their uh, interesting language. But I tried to include um, most of the main points that is covered by that law. And, and namely, you know, one of the big points is that the responsibility for rabies prevention and control is designated to the county boards of health. So um, we're all Georgians, I'm assuming here. We know that we have 159 counties in Georgia. So it becomes very onerous to, to try to determine you know, what county's doing what. So that um, right there is, is quite a limitation for us you know, who work at the state office and try to provide um, oversight and, and guidance as needed. Um, so the county boards of health are required to, are re are required to regulate the licensings of animals. Um, and then the law also states that persons bitten by suspect rabid animals are to immediately notify the County Board of Health and that owners or custodians of suspect rabid animals are to confine and report to the County Board of Health. Okay. <laughs> Um, and that the county boards of health need to promulgate rules and regulations to require vaccinations of cats and dogs. And then lastly, um, there were a few other points that I just didn't cover that aren't really applicable to this talk today, but this is very important. The county board of health is to appoint a rabies control officer to enforce this code and other laws which regulate the activity of dogs. So what's interesting is that, again, we have 159 counties here in our state, and in most counties, the environmental health specialist is designated um, as the rabies control officer, which you know, I think is a very positive thing because they um, receive training in, in uh, rabies epidemiology, prevention and control. Um, but in some situations, the rabies control officer is actually um, somebody at the animal control agency. And this happens primarily at the larger um, metro uh, counties, such as Gwinnett County, DeKalb County, Fulton County they have the resources to have you know, pretty large animal control uh, enforcement and in those counties it's typically the animal control agency. Um, and although they do work very closely with um, their environmental health specialist in the county, they are designated as the ra uh, rabies control officer. Oops. Is it the top? This one? These are us, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. So I mentioned the uh, Georgia Code um, that um, provides for the state rabies law. We also have um, a Georgia Code that requires certain notifiable diseases as reportable. So the Department of Health actually decides which diseases are reportable, but you can see that we have animal bites are uh, reportable. Um, and then rabies, human and animal rabies is also reportable. So we have sort of, you know, actually two laws that um, provide for um, uh, rabies surveillance. 
So I just wanted to talk briefly about the public health infrastructure in our state. Um, as I mentioned, we have 159 counties, so we have 159 county health departments. We have 18 health districts, and it's, uh, the health districts are actually prescribed uh, as a population base. So for example, um, if you look in the metro area, Fulton County is its own health district because there's so many persons that reside in Fulton County. Um, and not all counties, as I mentioned, have an animal control agency. So just to give you some more details about the prevention and control network in Georgia, um, at the county level we have, you know, one of the key staff persons are the environmental health um, specialist and the environmental health staff. They're the, the group that's going to typically um, make prevention and control recommendations, you know, around any potential exposures that occur in their jurisdiction. They're going to be facilitating the testing of animals as needed. And they're going to you know, generally be the go-to person that's going to um, be there to assist in any um, prevention and control activities. Um, we also have a local epidemiologists, and there's at least one epidemiologist in every district. So the epidemiologist can help the environmental health person um, deal with uh, assisting the um, person if it's recommended for them to receive post-exposure prophylaxis to, to get that, to be sure that that's done. Um, they can connect with us at the state office um, if there's some question about whether or not prophy is recommended. Um, and then also the animal control agency, which is resource dependent, and that again is um, found in some of the larger metropolitan areas um, and generally not very frequently found in the rural areas of the state. At the state level, uh, we have the uh, epidemiology branch and our acute disease epidemiology section. We have 40 or so epidemiologists that take um, call on a routine basis, that, uh, rotating call, and we receive calls from the general public and from district and local partners. Um, also uh, animal control agencies. Um, we also have our Georgia Public Health Laboratory that does our animal testing for us. Um, this funding to do animal testing is appropriated, um, so they are set up to, to do uh, testing. I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. And then the Georgia Poison Center is um, a partner that we contract with and they assist us in providing rabies uh, risk assessment. They speak to persons from the general public, um, healthcare providers, um, and they're very, um, very, very helpful in, in terms of handling the volume of calls that come to us. We also have other partners. Many of them are here in the audience today. Um, the Georgia Department of Agriculture, um, Animal Health Division, where they issue certificates of veterinary inspection. They're the ones that are going to handle livestock quarantine for us if that needs to happen. Um, also, we've had uh, some assistance from the livestock inspectors in situations where perhaps um, we're dealing with a potentially rabid cow or horse and um, it's just not very practical for us to, you know, have a veterinarian, you know, remove the head and then send it. Usually uh, the heads are sent um, via, via, via mail. Um, obviously that's not practical if it's a cow or a horse. And so then there's the logistic issue of how do we get that, that animal's head or brain um, to the appropriate laboratory. And most often they'll go to the uh, veterinary diagnostic lab because they have to remove the, the brain and the Georgia Public Health Laboratory does not have the equipment to do that. So livestock inspectors have been really instrumental in helping us get that um, large animal head to the diagnostic laboratory. Um, the, again, the College of Veterinary Medicine, Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, they have been helpful um, in terms of removing you know, the brains of some of these um, larger animals and they perform testing and then it's sent to the Public Health Laboratory for confirmation. Um, they also will provide um, testing for diagnostic purposes. Oops. And then I didn't want to overlook um, USDA, uh, our wildlife service um, partners that do the, administer the oral rabies um, program. Um, we have our APHIS um, partners that uh, also work with us, and then SQUIDIS, the Southeast Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study, and then also law enforcement. That plays a real key role in Georgia. Um, 
in transporting large animal heads to the diagnostic laboratory. We've had Georgia State Patrol officers um, that have volunteered before. They, they usually perform like a relay. They take it, um, you know, through their district and meet another state patrol officer and they just relay all the way to um, the diagnostic laboratory. So they're real key. Also, sheriff's departments in some uh, counties that don't have animal control, um, we, you know, require or uh, rely on them really to um, assist us with um, doing um, follow-ups to be sure that um, uh, pets are being quarantined if it's been recommended to do so. So they play a key role as well. So as far as rabies risk assessment goes, I know Dr. Drenzik, you know, discussed specifically what, what is done and how it's conducted, but you know, who does that in the state? Again, it's the county and district environmental health staff, um, sometimes animal control officers, the local epidemiologists, and then uh, epidemiologists at the state. So um, our rabies epidemiologist, myself, Dr. Drenzik, we have an EIS officer who's a veterinarian, and also the Georgia Poison Control Center. The Georgia Poison Control Center, as I mentioned, receives calls from healthcare providers, the public, and animal control officers. They provide risk assessments for us. They make recommendations um, for prophylaxis if, if needed, if indicated. Um, we do um, train them. They are using uh, approved resources, such as our J Georgia Rabies Control Manual and uh, Rabies Compendium. So they're a real helpful um, piece to the puzzle. Um, you know, there'd just be no way that we could handle the volume of calls, especially after hours and on the weekends. So just want to talk a little bit about animal rabies surveillance. And I think, what I kind of wanted to emphasize, this is generally, we do have an issue with the general public not really understanding um, what rabies surveillance is in Georgia and what it's not. So this is really geared towards that. I think everyone here in this room knows what we do with, with surveillance, but you know, it's really to inform um, prevention and control recommendations. We know that rabies is endemic here. And you know, I have to emphasize over and over and over, especially with the media, you know, that it's not to determine you know, if there, what the incidence or prevalence of rabies is in our state. It is you know, helpful to identify hot spots and to raise awareness, I think, but what we often see is that, you know, if one animal tests positive, there's just a panic in the community. So uh, we do a lot of, you know, education, um, you know, and, and, and try to um, infer to people that, you know, it, it's here and, you know, the take home messages are, you need to be sure that your pets are vaccinated and you need to avoid contact with wildlife whenever possible. So just a reminder for uh, general public and media, and as I was pulling images off the internet last night, my 10-year-old son leaned over my shoulder. He's like, wow, this is really cool. He said, too bad you couldn't find a rabid honey badger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so animal rabies testing in Georgia. Public health provides testing when a potential exposure occurs, and generally it's a human exposure, but we do test animals that have potentially exposed a domestic animal. We, we have limited resources, so we, we try to be, um, you know, very uh, judicious with that resource when it comes to testing for, you know, potentially domestic animals being exposed. And preferably after a risk assessment is conducted. Um, again, it's primarily wildlife that we're testing, but it does include in d domestic animals who have bitten humans. And in most all cases, we really try to encourage animal control officials, if they all possible, if they have the animal to observe, to observe the animal for the 10-day period. Um, it does cost, you know, about $140 perhaps per animal test that we conduct. And we do 2,000, 3,000, maybe 3,500 um, animals um, per year. And so that can get very costly, you know, over a period of, you know, several years. Um, and then again, testing to inform a public health action. So um, if we have a situation where a currently vaccinated domestic animal um, has had an encounter with a uh, raccoon and, you know, it's possible, likely, that that raccoon has rabies. If it's not really going to change, you know, what we recommend to do, we're going to recommend that that dog be boosted. But 
we don't necessarily need to, you know, um, have a, a very strict six-month quarantine period. Um, you know, we might say, you know, that's an animal that, you know, we may not necessarily have to test. And then again, the diagnostic lab for diagnostic purposes, when uh, a veterinary clinician is uh, seeing an animal with a neurological disease that hasn't exposed anybody on their staff and they just want, you know, a diagnosis, um, you know, we, we won't provide testing for those situations. So here's just um, the kind of the top number of uh, species that we've tested for the last three years. Um, in terms of positive results. So you can see the usual suspects are up at the top, the raccoon, um, skunks, and foxes. And we do uh, submit some, a very few number of samples to CDC on an annual basis for uh, rabies um, virus variant um, speciation or uh, confirmation. And you know, most of all of it is, of course, going to be southeastern raccoon species. You can see cats are, are up there on the list, and then we have, you know, our occasional uh, large animal. Those can be very, you know, um, interesting. Um, you know, they typically will have, you know, more of the what we call dumb rabies, and often those are associated with a lot of exposures because we have people either trying to feed them or they're doing oral exams because the, you know, cows or horses may be salivating. So. Even though there's only a few of them, you know, they generally are associated with, you know, a large number of uh, exposures. So this um, chart just shows a, kind of a, just a sample of animals that uh, are, were tested in uh, 2012. And uh, just to bring to your attention, so we tested, you can see at the top line, 373 bats, 27 were positive. Three bobcats, they were all positive. But if you look at cats and dogs, you can see we test a large number of cats and dogs, but only a small proportion of them um, you know, are positive. And you know, it, it may raise a red flag for us in terms of management. You know, why are so many cats and dogs submitted? Certainly it's appropriate if the cats and dogs um, you know, died after biting the human. Um, but you know, we try to always um, encourage animal control officers to, um, you know, to observe the, the cat or dog for 10 days rather than using public health dollars um, to go ahead and test them. So I wanted to shift focus a little bit and just we'll talk about the interesting animal case. Um, this was an um, investigation that Dr. Drenzik um, led um, back in May of 2001 when she was serving as the state public health veterinarian. So there was a rabid goat at the Georgia Agrarama. So if, I don't know if anyone's visited the Agrarama, but it's, a, it's a, essentially an agriculture museum and they talk about farming. There are lots of school field trips that um, make this, this trip. It's in, located in Tifton, Georgia. Um, and on May, May 2nd, a 17-week-old male goat housed there was a donation um, from somebody local in the area, um, was found to be in lateral recumbency and wouldn't eat. He was evaluated at a local veterinary clinic. Um, the physical exam revealed the animal to be non-ambulatory, mildly obtunded, and distressed. So he was transferred to the regional um, veterinary diagnostic laboratory and was euthanized. Uh, he was, uh, head was submitted to the public health lab there for rabies testing, and the diagnosis of rabies was made the following day. Uh, the uh, virus variant was determined to be southeastern raccoon. So you can imagine it was quite a large response. Here we have a facility, you know, that housed a rabid animal that um, is open to the public, and we're seeing um, field trips and, and uh, a large number of people coming through this facility. So it did result in a large public health response. Um, one of the first things that was done was that pub uh, public health education was provided. Um, there were press releases that were conducted. Um, then uh, a transmission period, risk period, was established, um, and that was determined to be two weeks prior to the onset. Um, which would have been April 20th to May 4th. Um, 
uh, identified potentially exposed individuals through visitor logs, um, field trip lists, press releases. And one thing I wanted to note is, um, you know, we talked about, um, Jesse mentioned poor journalism. Um, at the time, um, I, there had been communication with the local media there, and they had written something up in their, their local paper, the Tifton Gazette, and they were talking about rabies and, you know, the um, rabid goat and how rabies is 100% fatal. And this is a quote, rabies is 100% preventable by simply fascinating your animals. <laughs> Rather than, must have not heard vaccinating. So that was act actually published in the, in the Tifton Gazette. So, um, so then um, standardized exposure risk assessments were developed and conducted. So that would be something very similar to what we do um, with an outbreak case definition. So if you were at the um, agrorama between X date and X date and you had contact with the goat and you had, you know, f your fingers in their mouth. So it was very standardized um, uh, with the emphasis to, you know, try to catch the people that needed to be um, catch and, you know, conduct further risk assessments and um, uh, exclude the people that uh, we didn't need to directly address. Um, so then the need for post-exposure prophylaxis was evaluated for those that were um, considered to be high risk. And then you can imagine, you know, the logistics in coordinating post-exposure prophylaxis for a large number of people. Um, in Georgia, usually PEP is administered uh, through the private sector, um, but just logistically it would be really difficult to try to coordinate that for a large number of people. So they employed these variety of methods. Um, the, the health district there actually purchased rabies biologics. Um, and they administered PEP at um, some of their clinics. Um, some of the um, local hospitals participated in assisting. And um, other um, persons that resided in other health districts, we even had people from the metro Atlanta area that were down there, um, were referred to uh, local physicians or you know, the emergency departments in their area. So all in all, a total of 339 people were prophylaxed at sort of an estimated cost of $415,279. So a big effort. So now I wanted to just share with you our last human rabies case in Georgia, which was in the year 2000. Um, it was a 26-year-old male from Taylor County. Um, he was um, uh, pre presented actually to his healthcare provider on the 3rd for intractable vomiting. He was treated with an antiemetic, sent home. He presented the same night because he continued to vomit. Um, he was admitted with fever, respiratory depression, and confusion. He was transferred to the regional hospital a couple days later, um, progressively got worse, required mechanical ventilation, and then uh, developed cardiac arrhythmias and respiratory failure on the 10th and subsequently died. So the diagnosis was made post-mortem at CDC. It was determined to be bat virus variant, Mexican, Mexican free tail bat. Um, and what the investigation revealed, this was another one that Dr. Drenzik got to do, um, the patient had lived in, in this house, and I've got a picture of it to share with you, um, for three months. And there was a colony of bats living in the attic. And, you know, um, anecdotally, um, the patient um, had reported to friends on several, you know, nights he had awakened and actually sort of kick, had to kick bats off his feet um, and just did not appreciate that there was a risk, you know, of rabies um, in this situation. So um, he didn't seek PAP and just didn't appreciate the risk. So this is the house and... Uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> and then you can see it's an older house, and this is, you know, typically the kind of house that we see, um, um, you know, with bat colonies, just because of the, um, there's access, you know, up under the roof where the bats can get in. Um, and so this was all determined, you know, after the patient had already died, unfortunately. So just some resources. I think the, this has been um, 
displayed before. I'm happy if you want any of these resources to um, just leave your name and I can email them. Um, Melissa Ivey said she'd be happy. She's got some hard copies of our Georgia Rabies Control Manual. We can share that with you. And that's it. I have. That's all I have. You may have heard about this. <laughs> Any questions? We have one. Um, how many of the positive cats and dogs that you got from rabies had been vaccinated against rabies? Um, yeah, probably zero. Um, and do we ever, we, we probably didn't even capture that information at that time. Um, I'm not sure how, I mean, at least for the past several years that's been captured, but I can't recall any instance in which there's been a positive dog or cat that, that was current. Well, yeah, if, if someone knew it was not even current, just had ever been there. Okay, why well, we have time for more questions in a short, okay, go ahead. So, is it possible to get your database or when you test a wild animal, whether it's positive or negative, at a finer resolution than at just the county level? Could you, is it, well, so, is that reported in a day so that so uh, animal bite reporting is just very onerous and it's just, it comes from many different sources and we've attempted to improve that surveillance um, through developing an electronic module, a web-based module that Melissa is going to speak about um, in the next talk. So maybe that might clarify or prompt you to ask further questions. Yeah, and I guess the other thing too, I just wanted to mention, you know, take home message. You know, animal bite surveillance and, and animal rabies testing, you know, really is probably just, it's a factor of, you know, wildlife encounters. You know, for whatever reason, you know, people are coming into contact or domestic animals are coming into contact, you know, with wildlife. And whether, whether that is because of, um, you know, building in the area, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't know, we can't capture that data, um, you know, but, but you know, it's just, it's a very difficult um, surveillance to under, undertake, to be able to determine all of the pieces. Okay, Dr. Joe, you had a question? Yeah, I just had a question. Since you spent $450,000 on post-exposure, any consideration to talking to the state veterinarian about making rabies immunization a requirement for <laughs> show animals or just paying for that yourself since we could have probably vaccinated everything in the next right so three uh, years. sherry can can chime in but i believe that it was determined that it was the some insurance that the agrorama had that ended up ultimately covering Government. the bill for that um, you know, but I think they had to determine that, you know, that they weren't negligent or there was some sort of legal um, investigation around that. So luckily public health didn't have to pay for it because we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> I think we need to have a rebuttal over there. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, if you have animals that are vaccinated extra label, you know, that aren't listed as on the vaccine label as being covered by this vaccine, in these petting zoos and whatnot. Uh, how are you dealing with that? Well, that's your job, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. that question, Dr. Crane posed that a question similar to that earlier in that, you know, if you have a, uh, a, a wolf hybrid that's you know, vaccinated and it bites a human, you know, are you going to consider that dog vaccinated? But I, you know, we have to remember that we're going to observe a dog for, or a, a wolf hybrid or an animal, if possible, for the 10 day period, you know, to see uh, whether or not they develop, you know, any clinical illness. Um, and, you know, if they do, then we test them. So it's not really a concern so much when that vaccinated animal or off-label vaccinated animal bites a human, it's more of a concern when that animal who's vaccinated off-label encounters, you know, an observed encounter with wildlife. And then we're like, well, now what do we do? Is it a six-month quarantine? Do we recommend euthanasia? You know, what, what, what do we do? So I think that's, that's a challenge. But yeah, it's a great question. 
okay? 